All right, let's take a look at how a camera forms an image so we can actually work with it as a digital image afterwards. This is a process of image formation and the starting point is that all elements in, in the scene we will be looking at will emit light in, in different directions and it will also emit different types of light in, in different directions. So let's take a look at it. First of all, there are lots of different kinds of light or electromagnetic radiation we can uh, uh, there is a, around us uh, we are able to perceive what is inside this um, visible range let me just activate the, the drawing item here um, which is what will be, be visible to the human eye um, there are different animals that are able to sense uh, other parts of of the electromagnetic uh, spectrum, but we will not consider it uh, here. I also think it's a, a quite interesting um, example that um, that the visible uh, part of the light, the part of the light that our eyes are p able to perceive, also uh, coincides with the uh, amount of light where we have the maximum amount of light coming from the sun. I think that the humans are, or the animals actually evolved uh, to be able to utilize the available light to the best possible extent. If we look at the human eyes, um, it has uh, three different cones that are sensitive towards uh, different uh, wavelengths or different types of light. And we have the short cones that are sensitive to the blue light, we have the medium cones that are sensitive mainly towards a green light and we have the large cones that are sensitive towards uh, the red part of the spectrum. So, these were the different types of light. Um, now we'll take a look at how we actually generate an image uh, on the photosensitive uh, device, the, our image sensor. And one way of, of doing it um, is simply just to expose the, the sensor to the surroundings and then light from one point in the object will go in many different directions and end up in multiple locations on the sensitive uh, device. So this doesn't generate a, a proper image, it will just be a, a general measure of how much light is, is present uh, in the scene. Uh, a better approach will be to use a pinhole camera where the you take the image, place it, or the image sensor, place it inside a black box, and then make a tiny hole or tiny opening uh, in the box where light has to go through if it should come from the object and should reach uh, the sensor. Uh, if it doesn't pass through the hole, then it'll just uh, get stuck on, on the wall or the side of, of the box. And that way we can generate a sensor in here or an, an image on the sensor. So far, so good. One disadvantage of uh, this approach is that uh, to make a sharp image, you need to have a very small uh, pinhole uh, here, but that also the reduces the amount of light that is able to get through the pinhole and, and onto the sensor. So there's a balance you need to, to address here. Um, if you introduce optical elements like a convex lens in, in this case, you're actually able to collect light that image from the object in different directions and then the lens will collect them and focus them on a single point in the generated image as we see here. So in this way we're able to collect a lot more light than we otherwise would be able to and still get a sharp image. But there is a cost to this and that is the, the depths uh, of, of the focal depths of, of the object because the lens is only able to focus light that have uh, that origins from an object on a certain distance on on the sensor that is present afterwards and that depends on the focal length of the sensor or no on the optical system that is the strength how much is it able to alter the direction of the light this is governed by the thin lens equation we will not go into details ab about this here so as I mentioned before, human eyes have uh, three different uh, color sensitive uh, cones that we're able to perceive the balance between the, the incoming light. 
by standard means a, a CCD sensor, a CMOS sensor, which uh, is uh, the basic sensitive, um, light sensitive devices used in cameras. They do not have this built-in uh, distinction between red, green and blue light. So we need to put that into the system somehow. And it's actually usually also sensitive toward somewhat longer wavelengths than the human eye is. And in some cases that can actually be beneficial. So the approach used here is to put what is known as a buyer pattern in front of the of the CMOS device. So the CMOS device here is the, the gray part. And then on top of that, we have the buyer pattern. And the red cells in the buyer pattern will only allow red light to go through and it will block the red and blue light. And similarly for the green blocks or uh, uh, elements will only allow gray, green light to go through. So far, so good. So that allows us to t turn our sensor that was indifferent to different uh, wavelengths to something where each element is sensitive toward a certain wavelength or a range of, of wavelengths. And we can try to illustrate this process uh, on the image here. This is a color image, and we'll try take a look at how this will actually be perceived by a camera uh, with a, a biofilter on top of that. If we just look at the raw sensor readings from the biofilter, it will look like this. So we, you will have some bright areas and some dark areas, but we have more or less lost information about what color is present where. We can add that to the image uh, once again, so each pixel can only have a single color, either red, blue or green. And this is the resulting image here. And to form a proper color image, we will try to mix the the, uh, the perceived color. So if I have a, a pixel um, that contained uh, information about the green uh, pixels here, uh, we can try to obtain the value or estimate the amount of red and blue light in this part by looking at its neighbors. Um, and by doing that, we can actually fill in the remaining information for all the pixels in the field and we get this a bit coarse image but uh, it's still a color image and we're able to to work with it so this is the process of actually forming images using uh, a, a camera using a, a bio filter the cost is that you reduce the effective uh, resolution of your camera but you gain a bit uh, in in this uh, information about the color composition of the images, which can be very beneficial for doing certain object or tasks in the image. So far, so good. We can also take a look at what settings there are available in our camera, and we have mainly three types of set settings. We have the aperture, which uh, adjusts the size of the uh, hole where light is allowed to go through inside the lens. We have the exposure time, that is the duration where light is allowed to go through the camera and into the, the CCD sensor or CMOS sensor. And finally, we have the isosensitivity, which is a measure of uh, how much light you need to get into the sensor to actually get a, a full exposure. Um, so let's take a look at those one by one. The aperture, um, first of all, uh, controls the amount of light that get into the camera. Um, but it also controls the depth of field. So if you have a very small aperture, like seen uh, over here, we can see that both the eye, but also the, the tail of, of this uh, tree sculpture is uh, in focus. We can see details on it. Whereas if the same image was acquired with a large aperture, we can still have a, a single part of the image in focus, but uh, different parts of, of the sculpture will not be in focus at in the same time. These are some of the limitations in, in using a, a large aperture, but the benefit of it is that you gain much more light, so you can use a shorter shutter speed, for instance. The shutter speed is one way of controlling the amount of light that actually gets through to the system. The longer shutter speed you have, the more things can manage to move while you actually take the image. So, um, if you have a, a fast moving object in the scene or the camera is wiggling or shaking a bit, then it will be problematic to use a long shutter speed. 
and finally we have the ISO settings which determines how much light should actually go into the sensor to create a, a certain signal and you can try to visualize it uh, with a curve like this where here we have the amount of light uh, and here we have the the sensor value so if you have a, a low ISO setting you actually require a, need a large amount of light uh, over here before you get a certain uh, value when you lower the ISO setting um, the curve will become much more steep that also means that if you have a bit uncertainty in the amount of light here it will get mapped to a small region here for the low ISO curve but if you have the same uncertainty here it will get mapped to, to a much larger region in the uh, registered values and you see that in form of noise and an example of, of that is can be seen in, in the image over here in the ISO 3200 image where we have this uh, coarse grained noise in, in this image if you lower the ISO setting to 200 you get a much more crisp uh, image there with much less noise we can also utilize a histogram to describe the amount of light present in the scene for human view on of images it's usually beneficial to have a, a quite good exposure for machine to actually anal analyze the data i prefer to have a bit lower exposure uh, either the, the middle one here or, or this um, as they have no overexposed pixels that can be seen over here and that's a real benefit for for this um, because if you have overexposed pixels they're really hard to deal with in, in color calculations and so on so therefore I, I try to do much to actually avoid that they uh, show up in, in my images and I can do that by shifting the exposure uh, down a bit to avoid this overexposure and for what I'm doing I prefer to have underexposed images just slightly underexposed not pitch black but you can still be amazed how much information is actually present in in a bit underexposed images to figure out okay how to deal with aperture shutter speed and ISO settings um, usually if you go for for a certain direction uh, here with the aperture you can uh, adjust uh, the ISO setting a bit away from from the corner up here so if you increase the aperture you allow more light to get through and then you can actually decrease the ISO setting um, that um, and these two changes will then uh, compensate for each other and that's visualized in this exposure triangle a final thing I want to men mention is that using some cameras certain image artifacts uh, might show up and in this case we have this uh, rolling shutter uh, artifact here and that's present because uh, the image is not taken all at once but in lines right out from the top and then uh, downwards and if you then take an image of something that is in motion while you actually read out the, the image like this um, it will not be acquired at the same uh, timestamp and that can give us this uh, uh, rolling shutter artifact the technical reason is uh, we have this uh, shift of the exposure time for each of the rows in, in the in the sensor um, and one solution for this is uh, either don't look at things that are rotate or only rotate slowly compared to the shutter speed of, of the object and then please uh, keep your camera still a different option is to go for a camera with a global shutter where the entire image is taken at once and then you can actually utilize that uh, afterwards without having this uh, rolling shutter effect because it's a camera without rolling shutter so that was my overview of how you actually form an image using a camera and get some uh, digital uh, information out from from that scene onwards we will look at how to uh, actually calculate do calculations with uh, 
with such uh, values.